everyone to one of our favorite days of the week, Wine Wednesday, and this is the Kendall College Taste Talks. I'm Christine Duke, the Continuing Education Program Manager at Kendall College, and I have with us today Mary Ross, our expert on wine, who is going to enlighten us on the wines of Portugal. And she was already talking to me before we even all joined in here about how important Portugal is um, to wine and the influence of wine. And so I'm very excited to learn a little bit more, maybe think about some of my next personal purchases as well. So Mary, if you would like to take it away, just let me know when you want me to share a PowerPoint. Thanks very much, Christine. Uh, uh, Portugal, when I when I suggested Portugal to Christine, uh, I knew that I was going to have some refresher on this topic. But I've learned that Portugal is probably the littlest great wine country that you probably don't think you know anything about, but that you probably do. The wines from Portugal range from like lemonade, adult porch pounders, to high octane quaffs that were so traditional that Shakespeare in the 1500s plugged them as favorites for postprandial and murder weapons. And even though they just squeaked on to the Nielsen rating of retail sales in the United States in last place, Portugal is crucial to the most important wine region on earth in the fight against climate change. So you can see Portugal is filled with intricacy and uh, contradiction. So let's have our first slide, please. Okay, the littlest great wine region on earth, Portugal. Next slide, please. So, of course, Portugal is at the end of the Iberian Peninsula with Spain. Uh, it has a very long coastline. And then you will see on the right of the screen the island of Madeira. And that is actually just off of the coast of Africa. Thank you, Christine, which is also owned by Portugal. Next slide, please. Now, there is a quality control system in place. We're not going to bother with that today because there's just too much to talk about. Next slide, please. So, this is not the season. But as we know, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? And come spring, every retailer uh, in the known universe is going to stack Vino Verde high and watch it fly. Now, I have always said Vino Verde. I was recently corrected. It's actually Vino Verde. But I have to tell you, if you say that to an American retailer, they won't know what you're talking about. So if you say Vino Verde, it's incorrect, but most people will understand that. Now, Vino Verde is a very, very light wine. It's about 6 to 7% alcohol. It's dry-ish. Uh, as we know, Americans perceive sugar at about 6 to 10 grams per liter, and that's where most Vino Verde falls, 6 to 10 grams per liter. 
Uh, and also, Vino Verde is bottled with a little frizzante, a little spritz. So here we have a light, delicately fizzy, not too dry, not too sweet, just a porch pounder, a refresher. This is the wine to make wine slushies out of. This is a wine to make your sangria when it starts to warm up. Um, now, I was able to visit the Vino Verde region uh, not too long ago, and I was really very, very surprised at the quality of the Vino Verde wines, but we don't see them here in the United States. What we see are the porch pounders, uh, the inexpensive $6.99 to $9.99 porch pounders, uh, and, they're, and they're wonderful wines. Now, uh, what do we eat, eat with Vino Verde? Well, it's really just, you know, put it in a stadium glass and drink it with, to mass consumption. But if you want to have food with it, little seafood, uh, little cured meats, maybe some little grilled items, but very, very simple. Now, uh, there is red Vino Verde. Again, we probably won't see it in the United States. Uh, the white varieties, Alvarino, now right across the river, Ebro, from uh, Portugal, a river separates Portugal and Spain, right across the river in Spain, Alvarino is called Albarino. And it's one of the finest grapes in Spain because it's treated like a fine grape. In uh, Portugal, Alvarinho really isn't treated like a very fine grape. It's just a very simple grape. The uh, Arinto and the Lurero grapes are considered the finer grapes. And bottles in Portugal are labeled with those grape names. But once again, these really are not wines that come to the United States <clears throat> in general Vino Verde is just a simple, easy refresher uh, for the spring and summertime. I will say, because each producer in Portugal must pay into a kitty uh, of, of, of the state wine program, the country's wine program, Vino Verde is tremendously important to Portugal because there are thousands of small producers who need to pay into the kitty. Okay, next slide, please. So some of the some of us, uh, maybe not everybody, but some of us will remember. Did you ever know anyone who didn't like Matus? Uh, Matus, just like Blue Nun, uh, at one point was one of the top selling wines in the United States. Uh, of course, it had the the you know the the interesting bottle that everybody loved, uh, and uh, it was a favorite quaff of not only Jimi Hendrix, but also Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, and even Elton John, uh, I don't remember which song this was, uh, but in a famous lyric, uh, bragged about getting juiced on Matus. So it was a very famous and uh, well-consumed wine in the 70s and 80s. Now, uh, like Blue Nun, uh, it, 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 it's Matusa suffered a backlash. Uh, so they've rebranded, they have a new bottle, and you can see they're, they're, they're dubbing themselves a dry rose. And yes, in fact, uh, it's about nine grams per liter. So there will be a little bit of sweetness, but it won't be cloyingly sweet. 
Uh, and it is getting fairly decent reviews in the wine trades. So this is not something to be ignored. Uh, you know, uh, it was very, very popular at one point. Again, it was very important to Portugal in terms of the uh, revenue brought into the wine system. So if, the, if, if dry rosé uh, is something that you like, maybe you want to give it a try. Now, Asaf, last week you asked me about, uh, you know, those great value bottom shelf wines. And it occurs to me, uh, thank you, Roy, it occurs to me that if Matus is $9.99, I can't imagine what would be $3.99. So I, I would be very uh, hesitant or uh, I, would, I would buy those $3.99 wines with caution. If Matus is that much money, I don't know how much lower we're going to be able to go for a drink of wine. That's, but, that's a good tip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Say it again. That's a good tip. Yeah. Um, like every country that makes red wine, uh, Portugal does make a bunch of rosé. So this isn't the only rosé that Portugal makes. Uh, uh, oh, Goliath. I used to love Goliath, those Goliath wines. They used to be good, those Goliath wines. I don't think they're very good anymore. Uh, but anyways, that's enough. But Portugal does make other rosés. Matus, uh, at one point, was an extremely important brand. Okay, now we're going to move to something that is important. Next slide, please. Okay, so in, uh, you know, just about a year ago, the world, the wine world, <gasps> gasped because it was announced that the great region of Bordeaux had approved six grapes that had been planted in experimental vineyards uh, for six years. They'd been studied, they'd been turned into wine, and as I say, the world gasped and the grapes were announced. Now, uh, let me see. Can you see? Uh, I'm not sure. Can you see the whole? Part of it's like cut off. Here, it's... let's see if you can. Can you can you move the slot? Uh, yeah, I see. Yeah, there we go. So uh, the these three. The, I don't even know how to say this. These are hybrids, but Touriga Nacional is one of the primary red grapes of Portugal. And then here we have Alvarinho, again, uh, one of the primary white grapes of Portugal. And so Alvarinho is going to kind of stand in for Sauvignon Blanc, uh, and these grapes are going to kind of stand in for the five Bordeaux Reds, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, and Petit Verdot. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, and here it says uh, they can make no more than 10% of the blend in either red and white, and they can only take up 5% of an estate's total surface area. But this is a big deal. You know, Bordeaux is arguably the most important wine region on earth, both in terms of volume, uh, dollar volume, uh, tonnage, uh, reputation, prestige, cheap wines, expensive wines, history, and uh, that six grapes have been approved, uh, and two of them being Portuguese, uh, that that is a very big deal. Uh, and it's also, once again, a sign of Bordeaux's leadership, uh, you know, in the fight against uh, climate change. Okay. 
Next slide, please. So um, when we talk about uh, uh, Portuguese grapes, what's going on? Here, now move your sleeve. There you go. And I'm sorry, I'm using this new, um, I'm not using PowerPoint. I'm using a, a new slide presentation. That's why we're having a lot of uh, trouble with this. Okay, so look at these grapes. You recognize any of them? Gee, I, I don't. Uh, you know, Bastardo, that's really the name of a grape. Tinta Callada, Tinta Amarella. Uh, now, the ones that are famous are the Tinto, near close to the bottom, Tinta Barroca, Tinta Negra, Tinta Roriz is Tempranillo, uh, Tinto Cao, uh, Tinto Francesca, there's the Turiga Nacional. Those are the, those are the port grapes. So when you take your master sommelier exam, you got to know those grapes. Looking up to the top, Alicante Boucher. Now that's uh, an interesting grape because that grape is what's called a canturier. And that's one of the 14 grapes that have been identified with red flesh. Uh, as I've said, the 6,000 or so grapes that we've identified, all of them have white flesh, except for the Tanturier, the 14 Tanturier, and Alicante Boucher is one of those Tanturier. So once again, you're taking your master sommelier exam, that's a grape you ought to remember. Uh, but other than that, you know, you know, does anybody recognize any of those grapes? Because believe it, except for the port grapes, I don't. Okay, but that doesn't mean to say that the wines aren't wonderful. Let's move on to the next slide. You know, Portuguese, oh boy, now what's going on? Oh boy, what's going on? Is this, is the printing all screwed up on your copy? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have no idea. I have no clue. I'm sorry. Does that help? Uh, kind. Kinda. They were kinda. Well, uh, so these are shoot and the and here go to the end. Scroll to the end, and you'll see the prices. Sure. And then Roy wanted to ask: Have those grapes been made into any wines that are available here? No, uh, you know, we do have a uh, kind of a iconoclast named uh, Randall Graham, who uh, pioneered the Rhone grape varieties in California, because, you know, California's hot. We've discussed that we, we've got, we got all the French grapes just by a fluke. But California is not made for French grapes because France is a cold country. France, uh, I mean, California needs hot grapes. So this gentleman, Randall Graham, one of the original Rhone Rangers, he did try to introduce some Portuguese grapes. Nobody, nobody cared. You know, <laughs> it was just too interesting. Nobody cared. So I haven't heard of these grapes grown anywhere except Portugal. Okay, well, uh, let's see. The center grape, okay, go, ba go back. I'm sorry. I don't know why this has happened. Go back to the beginning. Yeah. To the, yeah. A little bit more. A little bit more, Christine. I'm sorry. No worries. more all the way all the way okay so this this i mean i i have the descriptions here i'm i'm sorry as i say i i think i have to pry open the purse and buy a new uh windows uh or, or microsoft office thing uh but these i've taken off the binnie's website i haven't tasted this confidential reserva uh I think it got, you know, 90 points someplace, $14.99. This Trace Otores, I have tasted. It's a wonderful bottle of wine. It's $9.99. And I have tasted this Crashto. 
and this is $14.99. So these are wonderful, earthy, dense, uh, nothing delicate about them, uh, you know, chewy, dense, a uh, little bit of funky funkiness, not really cleaned up very much. So great for grilled meats, great for stews. Uh, you know, these Portuguese wines, uh, these are wines for right now. They would be wonderful with grilled sausages, grilled meats, things like that. Next slide, please. And if you want to remember one label, remember P plus S. Uh, and P plus S stands for Pratt's and Symington. Now, Pratt's is Bruno Pratt's, uh, who had been the regisseur, uh, cellar master of one of Bordeaux's, uh, saint Steph's great properties, Codestronel. Uh, he took Codesternel from, uh, you know, a nothing property into one of Bordeaux's great properties. And then he moved on to Portugal. And uh, he has partnered with the Symington family, which is one of the great port houses. We, we will be discussing this in a couple of minutes. And these two great uh, traditions of wine growing, you know, a great tradition of Bordeaux and a great tradition of uh, Portugal have come together in these wines, P plus S, and I recommend all of them. Uh, Prats, Prats de Roriz, the 1499, you know, they're just wonderful. They all get huge ratings. Crisaya, uh, the expensive one, is, you know, often in, uh, you know, the top 100 wines of the world from the Wine Spectator. Uh, but the Prats de Roriz, uh, I'm assuming it's primarily Tinto de Roriz, which is Tempranillo. Uh, is a wonderful bottle of wine. And then the uh, wine at the end is, in fact, a port. And I realize I've got a bottle sitting uh, an, an arm's length away from me, this exact bottle. I, I, had, I forgot I had it. So if you have to remember one Portuguese label, remember P plus S. Okay, next slide, please. Sorry, one moment. Okay. Okay. So here we are. We've talked about Port's table wines, their white wines, their rosé wines, and their red wines. And now we're moving into fortified wines. Uh, of course, Portugal is very famous for their fortified wine, Port, which is made outside of the city of Oporto. Now, remember, we've discussed Sherry, the fortified wine of Spain, but Sherry is, in essence, a white wine. It's made from white grapes. Port is essentially a red wine. It's made from red grapes. Sherry is essentially a dry wine. Primarily, sherry is fermented all the way to dry and then sweetened back. In contrast, port is essentially a sweet wine in that we stop the fermentation before the yeast has eaten all the sugar. Now, fortified wine is simply a wine that's been fortified, given extra oomph, with the addition of distilled spirit. It can be neutral grain spirit, it can be brandy, 
It can be purchased from the wine lake, you know, the huge, you know, trillions of gallons of wine sit in some place that nobody wants and they're distilled. You can buy, you know, just distilled spirit. You can make it on your own property. But fortified wine is wine that's been fortified with the addition of distilled spirit. As I say, sherry is fortified after the fermentation is fermented all the way through to dry. Port is fortified during the fermentation before the yeast has eaten all the sugar. And so you pour in the distilled spirit, the yeast gets drunk, you know, passes out. And then at a certain point, you filter those uh, yeasts out so that the yeasts don't wake up and start fermenting again as they do in champagne. Now, fortified wine came into being uh, during the age of discovery, that wonderful age of discovery, the late 1400s, the 1500s, the 1600s. We've discussed this many times when countries were building these beautiful sailing ships and sailing all over the world looking for foods. You know, we think about the movie Mutiny on, on the Bounty. Uh, the Bounty was looking for food. They were looking for the breadfruit to bring back to Great Britain to, to ease starvation. So ships were sailing all over the world looking for food, looking for gold, and sadly looking for slaves. And of course they found all three. During this time, uh, next slide please. You know, we've also discussed that wine uh, was, you know, not only a favorite tipple for mind-altering qualities, uh, but it was a substitute for water. If you didn't have uh, fresh water and you needed something to drink, well, if you were coming from Great Britain, you probably had a good amount of beer on board. But wine was what most of the people carried on board, uh, you know, as a substitute for water. Also, you know, all this empire building led to a lot of war. And France was at war with Great Britain, at war with Portugal, at war with Spain. Everybody was at war at some time or another. And so if, if Britain was at war with France, well, Britain didn't have any wine unless they were friends with Spain or unless they were friends with Portugal. And wine doesn't travel very well. Uh, in the hot hold of a ship until it was discovered that if you pour distilled spirit into your wine, the distilled spirit would stabilize the wine. Well, where did the distilled spirit come from, you say? Well, it came from this ancient philosophy, science, magic called alchemy, which was brought to Spain and to Portugal by the Moors. Well, of course, the Moors didn't drink. It was prohibited by their religion. But alchemy was the study of the transmutation of elements. So uh, the example I always use, an alchemist if you put a piece of meat on a counter and walked away and the next day came back and there were, there were bugs all over the meat, the alchemist would say, ah, the meat is changing into bugs. The meat is transforming into bugs. That would be the alchemist's uh, reasoning. 
Now, there were two big payoffs in alchemy, base metal into gold, and the big payoff was death into life. So, in, 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 in Faust, Dr. Faust was a very famous alchemist, and Dr. Frankenstein would have been considered an alchemist, transferring something dead into something alive. Well, I don't know how successful most alchemists were with base metal into gold or death into life, but what they did do is invent distillation because the alchemists would, you know, there, were, there was a lot of wine sitting around in Spain, a lot of wine. And an alchemist maybe took a pot of wine and started to boil it and would see the steam rise. And they, they deemed that steam a spirit because it looked like a ghost, a spirit. This is where we get the term distilled spirits. Well, then some smart alchemist put a cap on the boiling tub and caught that steam and transmuted it back into liquid. So the alchemist transmuted liquid into a gas back into a liquid. And then when they tasted that liquid, you know, whammo! because that was pure alcohol. Now, they didn't know what they were doing, but we know today that alcohol, that alcohol boils at a lower point than water. So if you simmer alcohol and the steam rises, what's rising is the alcohol, pure alcohol. You're leaving the water behind and the alcohol vaporizes, then if you catch it and turn it back into liquid, that's pure alcohol. So now we have distilled spirit. We're in Spain. The Moors said, well, let, let's, let's pour it into some of this awful wine we got. Uh, so in Spain, they invented sherry. And in Portugal, they invented port. Uh, and then port got to be a very um, popular drink. First of all, it's high octane. It's sweet. Uh, and it was available. Uh, if Great Britain was at war with Spain, for instance, or at war with France, it could get its hands on port. As a matter of fact, Great Britain sent emissaries to port to establish port houses. And this is why <clears throat> most of the port houses have British names. Symington, Graham's, Coburn, Wars. Uh, these are all British names. Next slide, please. Good. And the terms for port, yes, are British terms. They're not Portuguese terms. They're British terms because the, the Brits, uh, after a certain point, were making all the port. There are a few uh, Portuguese-owned port houses, uh, but the vast majority of port is produced by British-owned port houses. White port, eh. You're not going to see very much of it. Uh, it would be similar to uh, Fino Sherry. After white port, there's two basic kinds of port. There's wood port and there's glass port. Wood port is aged in wood. Glass port is aged in glass. Uh, wood port includes... Oh, now before I go on, we want to remember that this has nothing to do with generic... American made or any place else made generic uh, cook and port or cook and sherry. It has nothing to do with those wines. Uh, and I would recommend not using uh, 
cooking sherry, cooking port, or cooking Madeira because there's a lot of salt added to those products and a lot of chemical stabilizers. So if you can afford a couple of dollars more to get the real McCoy, uh, your dish will taste much better and it will be better for you. Okay, so if we're talking about port, we're talking about the real McCoy from Portugal. I will add Australia uh, does make some darn good ports under the uh, uh, label of Yalumba. But those are the only uh, others that I would recommend. Okay, so Ruby Port, very young, uh, you know, you know, just knock it back. As a matter of fact, you know, many people serve it on ice. Many people pour it into Coca-Cola. It's just simple. It, it is tannic uh, because these are very thick-skinned grapes. They're withstanding all this sunshine. So the, 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 the grapes, the, the, the skin must get really, really thick. So there's a lot of tannin, but there's a lot of sugar too. So uh, the tannin kind of offsets the sugar. Ruby port's going to be the simplest, cheapest port. Uh, then we kind of take a step up uh, to a new category called late bottled vintage. This is kind of an answer to people who want a port from one vintage and they want it to be kind of aged. Uh, and so this, this category was just, just made up. Uh, the problem was in the 50s, uh, port producers just weren't selling all their port. They had all this port sitting around and they had to do something with it. So they made up this category. So it is one vintage. It doesn't have to be declared. We will see later that vi a vintage port has to be declared by the house. Late bottle vintage doesn't have to be declared. And the benefit with late bottled vintage port is that the sediment has already been removed. We will see when we get to vintage ports, there's no way to remove the sediment. But late bottled vintage, because it's been put in, it's been aged in wood for a long time, uh, and the vintage date will be someplace on the bottle, and then it, it's siphoned out of the barrel and put into a bottle. So the benefit of late bottled vintage is there's no sediment to worry about. It's not going to be a great vintage. They don't use their finest vintages in late bottled vintage. But, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's definitely a step up, a big step up from Ruby. Uh, and both of these have, you know, kind of berry and chocolate, sweet berry chocolate flavors. Then we get to tawny. Now, tawny is aged in very small barrels. And it can be aged on, you'll see a 10-year ten, ten tawny, 20-year tawny, 30-year tawny, and 40-year tawny. That's the average age. It's not, you know, every drop in there isn't 40 years old, but it's the average age. And you can imagine if wine has spent even 10 years in a small oak barrel, it's developed, you know, those wonderful brown spice caramel. It doesn't have the berries and chocolate of the other ports. It's got more caramel and maple kind of uh, aspects. Uh, tawny, for instance, you would serve with flan or uh, creme caramel or an affy tapple, something like that. Whereas the other ports uh, the small, uh, the other ports are aged in huge barrels that don't um, transmit so much flavor. 
They're aged in this, these huge barrels, Asaf, mostly for transfer of oxygen, not for transfer of flavor. But the tawny is aged in smaller barrels, so there's a lot of transfer of the wooden flavor into the, into the port, and a lot of transfer of the color, too, into the port. Uh, then we have this uh, category, cojeta. I, I'm not even sure I'm say, saying this correctly. Uh, this is a very specialized, I, I will say that cojeta also means vintage in Portuguese. So there can be a little bit of a confusion, but a cojeta port is a tawny aged for at least seven years sometimes up to 50 years. Now, I would not recommend these unless you're in Portugal. In the United States, uh, maybe a 10-year tawny, maybe. But when you're getting to 20, 30, 40-year tawny, and you don't know where these wines have been stored, you know, they can get tired. Uh, so, as I say, if you're in Portugal, go ahead. Have a 50-year tawny, have a colgieta. But in the United States, unless you really, really know your merchant, uh, I would stick, uh, you know, maybe to a five or a 10-year tawny uh, for the freshest, most lively flavors. Next slide, please. Okay, now this is this is this is the uh, category of port that I would recommend to everyone. Uh, this is another kind of a new style <clears throat> called vintage character. I think they've recently changed the name to reserve port. Most people know it as vintage character. Uh, thank you, thank you for try, trying to fix this. Uh, so vintage character ports are the top ruby ports, uh, relatively recent vintages, and uh, they're terrific prices, uh, you know, 95 points for decanter, uh, you know, from decanter to give 95 points, that's a pretty big deal. And these are easy to drink. There's no sediment. Uh, I think the Noval Black is uh, less money than the six grapes. Uh, these are easy to drink. They're wonderful. Uh, you know, classically served with blue cheese and nuts and pecans, maybe a, a, a chocolate cake. Uh, growing up, uh, what my sister and I left for Santa Claus was a bottle of port uh, and some Roquefort and, uh, and, some, and some Spanish almonds. And Santa Claus was very, very appreciative in that it was all gone the next day and we got wonderful, wonderful presents. Uh, so, you know, these, unless you want a tawny for that caramel flavor, these vintage character ports are where I'd like to send you. When you're taking your master sommelier exam, uh, each house now has their own vintage character brand. So for instance, Graham's, their brand is six grapes. Quinto do Naval, which is one of the Portuguese houses, uh, their, their vintage character is called uh, Naval Black. Wars is called Warrior. So uh, each of the houses has their own vintage character. And uh, this is where I would recommend you spend your money on port. Unless, next slide, please. Unless, oh, damn it. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, Christine, I'll pry open the wallet and I'll bring back PowerPoint. Uh, this is the most expensive port ever sold uh, from it is number on the side. Shall I scroll over to it? Yeah. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going all the way, all the way, all the way. Keep going. 
Keep going. Okay. Oh, goodness. 155,000 uh, American dollars. It's a 25.4 ounce bottle. I don't know that. Now, it is a Lalique bottle that was handcrafted for uh, this port. Uh, but that's about $6,000 an ounce. So if anybody wants to uh, get something like that, let me know and I'll come over. Now, the problem with vintage port, vintage port, of course, is port made from one year, one vintage. It must be declared. So the house uh, submits to the Consejo Regulador, the uh, trade organization, we're going to declare this vintage. And it gets to be, you know, the, the uh, aficionados, you know, watch. Oh, you know, Graham's is declared. Is Nearport going to declare? Or is Wars going to, are the Symingtons going to declare? Uh, at that time of year, frankly, I don't know when it is, uh, but port aficionados are on the edge of their seat to see who's going to declare their port. So the best grapes of a single year, outstanding. The wines are kept in barrel for just two years, and then they must go into bottle where they are aged and aged and aged and aged and aged. Now, of course, the problem, we all know, what is fermentation? Fermentation is a natural process in which yeast eats sugar to produce alcohol, carbon dioxide, and byproducts. And those byproducts are sediment. Some of those byproducts are sediment. And in, a, in glass port, in other words, a port aged in glass, the sediment is still in there. And so it has led to, you know, the beautiful tradition of decanting your port, you know, beautiful decanters. And, you know, it's just a beautiful, beautiful tradition. Uh, but it's also a pain in the neck if you're not, you know, used to it. So, uh Vintage port, it's not always going to be $155,000, but it's always going to be expensive. Although, as I say that, port, vintage port, is one of those categories that, um, what's it called when something gets a lot more in price? Increases? Well, yeah. In, well, inflation. Uh, no, I, I, Appreciates. It appreciates. Port is is the wine that appreciates the most. So if you so collect, it makes sense if you wanted to be a collector to buy a vintage port as soon as it's released, sit on it for fifty years, and then sell it because they appreciate in value more than any other wine. Frankly, because they last longer than any other wine. Okay. Well, now we're getting into something really wacky. Next slide. Madeira. The Isle of Madeira, the volcanic Isle of Madeira that is just off the northwest corner of Africa. Uh, it was discovered in the 1600s by a Portuguese, uh, you know, trader who claimed it as Portuguese. As you can see, it is not uh, a very hospitable island uh, in most cases. Uh, as a matter of fact, at one point, the island caught fire and burned and burned and burned and burned and burned and burned. So the soil is a very interesting combination of volcanic lava and just ash from the island burning and burning and burning. Next slide, please. Okay, well, it's not all, it's, all of Madeira is not inhabitable. Uh, of course, there are beautiful ports. You can see uh, here where the little isle of, of Madeira is. But you can also see that the, uh, the vineyards all must be terraced. 
uh, you know, these terraces cut into the rock uh, by hand. Now, Madeira wine, now how do I explain this? Uh, I won't even bother talking about the grapes. Maybe the grapes will come up in a little bit. I don't know. If you put a gun to, oh no, I could, I could mention the grapes. Ah, feeling a gun to my head, I could, I could name the grapes. Uh, but they're not grown anywhere else and probably shouldn't be grown anywhere else. Uh, let's go to the next slide. The primary distinguishing feature of Madeira is a trait called matterization. And matterization in every other wine except Madeira is considered a fault. Uh, you know, you, you're in a restaurant, you smell a wine, it's matterized, you send it back. It's a fault, but in Madeira, it's considered uh, an attribute. What Madeira is, uh, it's caused by the exposure to heat and oxygen, causing the wine to oxidize, and it brings out kind of a caramel-like flavor a brown color, and an acidity. Again, if you taste it in any other wine, it's a fault. But in Madeira, it is an attribute. Now, how did this come to be? Well, uh, again, the age of discovery. And these, you know, wines were put into a barrel and stowed in the bottom of the ships, used as ballast in many cases uh, on long sea voyages. And the rocking of the ship and the, the heat of the hold of the ship and the, and the wine being crashed against the sides of the barrel produced this quality called matterization, uh, which became so popular uh, that there's actually a term that I forget now, meaning round trip, that the flavors, this matterization wouldn't fully, uh, the wine wouldn't fully take on the matterization unless it had been to India and back. So wines were actually named, labeled with this term round trip. Now, uh, Madeira was very popular uh, in the American, it was, it was popular everywhere, in the American colonies, in India, in China. Uh, you know, it, again, it was high octane. And it has these very interesting caramel-like flavors, but the acidity is what kind of makes it refreshing in the mouth. Well, now we don't have sea seafaring vessels, and of course, cruise ships, uh, you know, we're not putting liquor in there, we're putting people in there. So it would be just too expensive to age the wine in the ships. So now, of course, it's done with uh, technology called, S I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it, but you know, it's, it, it's done in stainless steel tanks. Uh, in between the ships and the stainless steel tanks that are heated, uh, you know, the barrels were, were, were put in what they called ovens, uh, uh, wooden houses, that were built in the hottest areas of Portugal. And the wines were just kept in those hot, hot, hot uh, houses to heat, heat, heat. Okay, let us go to the next slide, please. And this, oh God, uh, this is why, um, oh, I know, Christine, I bet I know why. Uh, you you can't get rid of the, the the side panels, right? No, 
It won't okay. let me do the slideshow. But all right, I promise. PowerPoint next or, week or Grandma. next or next time it gets me early. I'll see if I can adjust it. So I didn't have time today. Sorry. No, no, no. I don't want you to go to that trouble. Okay. So uh, most of the most of the Madeira styles are named after the grapes by which they are made. Cercial uh, is the driest. Uh, nine grams per liter residual sugar, which again, most Americans would consider dry. Americans uh, taste uh, sugar from about six grams to about 10 grams. Europeans taste sugar beginning at about three grams per liter. Uh, but most Americans would consider cercial dry. Uh, high toned colors, which means kind of uh, green gold, almond flavors, and searing acidity. Uh, this is what helps Madeira age. The alcohol and the searing acidity locks together uh, and allows uh, Madeira to age. And, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, then we go to Verdeljo. Uh, now, uh, it's interesting, there's a Spanish grape called Verdejo, which is different. Uh, so there's Verdeljo and there's Verdejo. Uh, Verdejo, a little bit, well, actually now we're getting pretty sweet. Smoky uh, from being in a barrel. Again, high acidity. Now we have Bual, also called Boal. Now we're getting really, really sweet. 63 grams per liter. This is chewy. This is sweet. Now we have Malvasia, also Malvasia, or Malmsey, which we're going to be discussing in a little bit. Now we're getting really, really, really sweet. Malmsey is the sweetest form of uh, Madeira. And uh, ages uh, seemingly for hundreds of years, hundreds, hundreds of years. I mean, you see wines at auction still from the 1800s. And these are wines that people are going to drink. Uh, the lock, when we get to the sweeter styles, the lock between the sugar, the alcohol, and the acidity allows these wines just to age and age and age. There have been wines brought up from the sea floor from the 1700s. Of course, that's a little bit different because they've been aged without any oxygen at all. And those are perfectly all right. But wines that have been aged in a good cellar uh, of Madeira can age uh, it's not unusual for them to age 100 years, 200 years. Uh, the top selling uh, category in the United States is rainwater. It's very light, uh, only a touch of sweetness, but it doesn't use the Vertelho grape. Okay, next slide, please. And here we have how Malmsey, also called Malvasia, uh, came, became to be known all over the world uh, because it was rumored that Richard III murdered his brother, the Duke of Clarence, by having him drowned in a cask of Malmsey. Uh, now, whether it was Shakespeare who started this rumor or not, uh, it caught on, uh, and, and now everybody just takes it as fact uh, that evil King Richard, who turned out in history wasn't really that evil after all, uh, but evil Richard III uh, drowned his, you know, good, good Duke of Clarence in the butt of Malmsey. And if you ever want to hear a beautiful, beautiful discourse on death and existentialism uh, and the fear of death. Uh, 
and I tried to find it. I, I don't know why I couldn't find it. Uh, try to find John Gielgud's uh, recitation of uh, the, the, the Clarence's Dream, it's called. Clarence's Dream. Uh, it, it is horrifying, uh, but it, 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 you know, this was Shakespeare's genius that he could put uh, these very, very human fears into this. You actually found uh, this Gil Good speaking the speech, Roy? No. I, 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 I could find it years ago. I don't know why I can't find it now. It's, I'll find it in a moment. That's just Richard III. They found where he was buried. It okay. Was where Richard III was buried. Right. Oh, okay. It wasn't known for centuries. They found him under Carver. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, yes. I remember that. I remember that. But this is, uh, this is the Duke of Clarence. Uh, so, next slide, please. Of course, most people know uh, Madeira today as a cooking wine. Uh, and of course, Beef Wellington, you know, the great, you know, tribute to uh, common, what was he, commandeer, uh, A Admiral Wellington. Uh, and Tornado's Rossini, uh, Sauce Madeira. Uh, or Tornado's Rossini was, I believe, uh, developed by none other than Auguste Escoffier. So one of the great meat recipes. Uh, and Madeira is also used in beef Wellington. So that's, you know, little Portugal. Who would have thought that little Portugal that nobody really thinks about uh, has so much depth and complexity uh, going on in their wine scene. Okay, so does anyone have any questions for Mary on anything Portuguese or Port, Madeira, any of the exciting things we've discussed? I do have to say very sadly, uh, years ago, Portugal had hired uh, one of America's top uh, wine pros to manage their trade outreach. And uh, the tastings were fantastic. Uh, you, you know, we, we didn't have any idea that these wines were so, so wonderful. Uh, sadly, he was summarily removed. And since then, there's been no uh, Portuguese uh, trade activity whatsoever, which is really too bad. Oh, you know what? Actually, um, bias off. Roy, you had a question on port leftovers. Yes, Mary. Uh, okay, all these nice wines, fortified wines and others are produced and you say that the, the, the wood ports, they're, de, they're, de, uh, they're decanted. What happens to the lees? What happens to the sediment? Is it used? Is it, in this country, for example, we have DDG, uh, dry distiller's grain, which is used as a, as a uh, in, in feedlots for cattle. Is, are the lees, are, the, are, they, are they used as a food additive, uh, flavoring? How are they used or, or, or are they used at all? Well, of course, in Italy, uh, they're turned into mar. Uh, or, or in France, they're turned into mar. They're redistilled and given to the workers, uh, and that's that's where grappa comes from. Uh, it's it's the redistilling of the seeds, the stems, the leaves, all the waste. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right, Roy. Uh, they're used in some sort of uh, livestock. Yes, it's it's used somehow. Uh, but I have never asked specifically where. Okay, and then, oh, sorry, go ahead, Bray. I, I just said, as far as a shopping list, Hello, Loretta. Who, do you, who do you recommend as a, as a good brand? I know there's some popular commercial stuff out there from Madeira. I'm a fan of it, but you can't find, I guess, decent stuff. And it has all the, I, I like what you say about it. It's really edifying, but where can you get the... 
Right, she's got she's got show and tell. She's, she's got the answer. Oh, good, 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 good. good. Um, Blandy's. Oh. Blandy's is really the only house that uh, has a real foothold here uh, in the United States. Okay. Uh, there's another property, a label called Broadbent. Now, Bartholomew Broadbent is the son of the great uh, Michael Broadbent, who, of course, was the greatest palate in the world and ran the uh, Christie's Fine Wine Auction. Uh, Bartholomew Broadbent has started uh, an importing company, and he does have a little line of Madeira. They're not great Madeira, but they're very credible Madeira. Any relation to James Broadbent, the actor? I don't think so. No. Uh uh. I'm sure that would have come up at some point. I'm sure it would have come up. But Blandy's is the one that you're going to find uh around okay thank you my pleasure okay and then uh loretta mentioned in the comments that she has a question on wine of portugal that she is currently drinking nice to be on topic loretta what is look your at that Ooh, i saw that on the Binny's uh website now loretta um what are the grapes i don't know because it says it's a blend Back here. And it doesn't tell you, huh? It doesn't tell you. That's why okay. I was going to ask can, you. Can you show that bottle again, please? Yeah. Silk and spice. Very nice. Blend. And then the back. Whoa. I did see it on the Binny's website. Uh, and, and does it taste silky and spicy? It does. It really does. They're wonderful. And how much did that bottle cost you? Uh, 12 bucks. Yeah. They're wonderful values. Yeah. Interesting flavors, wonderful values. Yummy. <laughs> yes, yummy. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> hey, Mary, I did some shopping and I got the Sirocco. Oh, got the Sirocco. And also the uh, Rayburn Chardonnay. I'm going to be interested to try that. Yummy. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Loretta. Oh, and then the Morgan too. I found the I found the Morgan Pinot Noir. Excellent. So I have some good tasting wines to try out. Some you got some work ahead of you, huh, Roy? <laughs> yeah, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> yeah, Loretta, are you a, are you a, are you involved with Kendall? No, I'm I'm an uh, NLU professor. LU. National Lewis. NLU. Nas National, Lewis. National Lewis. Oh, isn't that great? National well, thank you for joining us. We love to have <laughs> Yes, we love that. More people are joining our taste talks. And um, I think. And we do tastings too, Loretta. We taste together. Yeah. Okay. okay. So Deborah, Deborah, thank you. Here we go. Here, Deb has put the breakdown of the grapes for the silk and spice in the chat. Oh, okay. So look at that. Thank she's you, Deborah. She is always amazing at finding stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any questions on wines in Portugal at all? Mary, have you heard of those grapes? Tariga Nacional. Tariga Nacional. That's the one. Uh, you know, that's the big one. Tariga Nacional, and then uh, Tinto Roriz is the big one. Uh, Corsira is in there. Uh, there was one called Baga. No, I mean, it just goes to show how many grapes that, I mean, these, the, these grapes aren't sitting under a rock someplace in a jungle. These are being turned into wine, right? And, yes. and, and I've been in the wine business 30 years and I've never heard of that grape. So it just goes to show you how many grapes are out there today. A quick question, if I might. You said that California is too hot, hot, hot to grow these grapes. No, to grow French grapes. French grapes. But would any Portuguese, would you, if you find any California or Oregon vintners maybe getting these grapes over here to make domestic Portuguese wines? Well, Oregon, no, because Oregon is cool. Remember, Washington is hot. Oregon is cool. As I said, this, uh, this you know, iconoclast, uh, Randall Graham, I wouldn't be surprised at all 
uh, if Randall Graham made a Toriga Nacional. Uh, but nobody's in, you know, who cares? You know, <laughs> who cares? There's so many grapes. Uh, yeah, but is he bringing it up because of the volcanic soil? In, it in would be the heat, Loretta, primarily the heat. Uh, and you're very right. We don't have that kind of soil uh, in California. We don't have that volcanic, ashy soil. So, Roy, I really, uh, I'm racking my brain, but I really, uh, other than Randall Graham, I really can't think. Oh, well, of, I to, I'm just curious. I'm just, I'm just curious. I mean, the, the, the soils in, in, in Oregon and Washington are, are volcanic. They, 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 then they're, they, they, so I'm just curious if the conditions may Well, be that's interesting. Washington, yeah, you're right. right. Mount St. Helens and that. You're, yeah. you're right. Uh, my background is in geology and we, and oh. I, I, I was out in that area and, and it's, it's, it's been vulcanized over wow. many, I mean, It's got the soil. I'm, I'm curious why, this just kind of stuck out when you said that, the Portuguese wines had all these grapes that weren't grow, weren't grown here, or they're grown yeah. only there. I thought I'm surprised there weren't there wouldn't be conditions here for someone, Graham or whoever else, I don't know, to bring those grapes here and try and grow them. That's all I'm. Well, it's a good thought, but sales, right? Sales, sales. Well, it helped Matus and Lancers. Both were those <laughs> uh, popular Portuguese wines. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay yeah, well we're no, way, we're way <laughs> over <laughs> well thank you everyone for joining thank us oh mary evening. thanks oh, loretta thank hope to see you again a pleasure right. um so tomorrow just to note tomorrow we do have mary's out so we <laughs> have um marty natural will be with us we are going to be doing one uh wine beer trivia tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So actually it's going to be a fun mix. We're going to start out with a trivia game and then Marty's going to wrap it up with a little lecture with um, some more fun facts about beer. So you can get to learn all of the goodies and stump all of your friends when you're out having your next beer. So thank you again, everyone. Always a pleasure. Yes, Roy. Just a quick question. I, this was I, I liked that you stayed and, and, and went into, into detail. And I haven't been to all the wine sessions, but this is one of the more informative. I was kind of waiting for this one. I'm glad she got to it. These are the kind of wines that I think I, I think are, are are worthwhile to pursue. And I'm, do you if the if the PowerPoint gets kind of cleaned up and it's useful, can can that be made available? I'm just kind yes. of curious. Yes, Thank I you. will talk to her to see if we can or I'll try and fix it myself and send it out to you guys. So, yeah. No problem. Thank you everyone for joining and hope to see you at our beer trivia tomorrow. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.